Good morning, men. This morning we'll do a shout out to the men's leadership and Bible study at Seacoast Church in Charleston, South Carolina on the campus. It's a multi-site church, 11 sites, about 10,000 people, and about 1,100 people gather at the, uh, at the Charleston campus. And Charlie Librand tells me that they have 15 to 20 men meeting during the year, and now in the summer they've broken into smaller groups. Uh, they do the webcast, the online Bible study. He uh, said in his note to me that they, they do different things. He said that they were planning to go down to Colonial Lake in Charleston. Any of you know where that is? It's that, uh, it, it's kind of like a, I don't know, it's kind of like a, um, a, giant, a giant limestone swimming pool, I think. Anyway, it's in Charleston. He, so he said that their group was going to go down there on a mission and clean up litter. But he said, it's pretty clean down there, and so I'm going to have somebody go down on Tuesday night and spread some trash around. <laughs> so we'd like to give a shout-out to you guys this morning. Why don't you join me in welcoming the guys from Seacoast. So I heard a story about a um, community college professor who was arguing with his students about the benefits of socialism. And so the students were all set that socialism would be, be good for America. And so he said, okay, well, uh, let's, let's do a little experiment. What we're going to do is we're going to all take my tests, but instead of giving you your individual grade, what I'm going to do is I'm going to average all of the grades and, and uh, everybody in the class will get the same grade. So they took the first test and those who studied hard got A's and those who didn't study very much got D's and F's. But the average for the class was a B and so he gave everybody in the class of B. And the, the students who got, 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 the, uh, got the Bs who had worked really hard were a little miffed. And of course, those who didn't work very hard and didn't study very much were quite delighted. Well, they took the second test a few weeks later. And when the professor averaged the grades, it turned out that the average grade had dropped from a B to a D because the students who had worked very hard on the first test didn't work quite as hard on the second test, and those who didn't work very hard on the first one worked even less to make good grade, uh, a good grade on the, on the second test. And by the time they took the, the third test, the average grade for the class was F. In his entire history, he had never done this, but he, he flunked the entire class on the final grade proving to them and just demonstrating to them how socialism is not a very good idea. You know, there, there are a lot of ideas that just really don't want to work. Uh, big ideas and small ideas, too. For example, the U.S. Bureau of uh, something <laughs> reports that 56% of all new businesses fail within the first four years, 56%. Booz Allen Hamilton ran a study and found that 86% of new product ideas never even make it to market. And of those ideas that do make it to market, between 50 and 70% of those ideas fail. MIT's uh, Sloan Management Review confirmed that, and they found that uh, also that 70% of uh, all new products that make it to market fail. And uh, in my research for my uh, doctoral dissertation, I found that two-thirds of all organizational initiatives fail outright. A lot of ideas just really don't want to work. There's another, another thing going on. President Chavez of Venezuela, his idea is to start a revolution, uh, a reform revolution. And so he is expropriating the, the land from 
the landowners and distributing it among the poor. And so since around 2001 or 2002, when he, when he started this, he's redistributed 5 million acres. He's, he's taken 5 million acres of farmland from farmers and then redistributed it to the poor. With the, but his idea is, is that he's going to decrease his dependence on foreign imports for food and give power to the people. Well, since he began this program, his country has become six times more dependent on foreign imports of food than it was before he started. You know, some ideas just really don't want to work. In fact, two-thirds, fully two-thirds of, of all ideas are just, just fail outright. And even of the one-third that do work, a lot of them really don't work that well. Well, the kingdom of heaven is the most effective idea that has ever been introduced. It is the most successful revolution of all human history. And so this morning we're going to talk about the final of these seven parables in Matthew 13 about the kingdom of heaven in the context that this parable is the final chapter on Jesus' idea, Jesus' revolution, which is total global conquest. Jesus' idea, his mission, is to seek and to save the lost. He sees everybody as a sheep that needs a shepherd. He loved the world so much that he became a man and entered time and space, and he is bent on his mission, total global conquest. We've talked about this a little bit before. So in the, in the, in the passage today, let's, let's read what he has to say, and then we'll kind of uh, try to contextualize it. And then bring it home for what it means at 9 o'clock when the phones start ringing and the customers start complaining. Verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net or a dragnet that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Just note that Jesus here is, again, using the, the ordinary, everyday language that's common to the people in the time. In fact, he's, he's now only talking to the, to the 12 disciples. He's pulled them apart to go over these last parables. And, um, and he's using the language of fishermen with... Fishermen, it's very interesting. Verse 48, when it was full, when the net was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and they collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out, his, out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And so Jesus is giving new information, new treasures to these disciples who then will, they will be teachers. They will be teachers. You will be teachers. You, ha you have these new treasures too. These, this is new information. And uh, so now the question becomes, why uh, is Jesus teaching like this? Why is, why is Jesus, in fact, in the parable of the tares, the explanation was it's, the, it's exactly the exact same conclusion. In verse 43, then the righteous, uh, in, in verse 42, it says, they will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So why is Jesus talking this way? I mean, he's going to, uh, isn't he a little concerned about scaring people, making people jittery, talking about throwing people into a fiery furnace and weeping and gnashing of teeth? Well, he did come to seek and to save the lost, and his mission is total global conquest. And uh, so in this parable, it, the motivation is, is that 
he, he, wants, he wants us, he wanted the disciples, he, he wants us to see there is a finality to the world. There is a reality that there are two groups of people. He wants us to understand that there are two groups of people and that we would, that there would be a motivation that would come because we're afraid of being in the wrong group. Is that, is that so, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, that's so politically incorrect, Jesus. I just can't even believe that you would talk like that, that p people are going to go into a fiery furnace with, where they'll be weeping and gnashing. Teeth. But he says it everywhere. You know, it's just, it's just, wow. It's just, Lord, it's just not really, not very 21st century. I mean, it's so, it's so antiquated. It's so old fashioned. But he talks about the fact that there is actually a reality called hell. And there is a finality. It says in the text, it says, this is how it will be at the end of the age. There will be an end to the world. And when that happens, there will be a separation into these, these two groups. Well, I think that his motivation for telling us this is not so much that uh, this is where he wants us to go, but this is where he wants people not to go. And, you know, when you read other texts, this is a sheet out of my Bible study preparation worksheet. And so each week, as I'm preparing a message, I want to make sure that, that my attitude to speak to you is to the best of my ability in alignment with Jesus' attitude toward you as well. Uh, you know, and you've been and you've heard a speaker before. Uh, he's just so angry. And you think you're thinking, wow, was Jesus really that angry or or he's so lovey dovey and you're wondering, well, gosh, was Jesus that 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 milk toast? And and so, uh, you know, I could easily do that, too. And and I'm sure I do. And I apologize for that. But to the best of my ability, I try to get my attitude in sync with Jesus attitude by using this worksheet. And one of the things on there uh, is to review how Jesus sees us. And he, he sees us like sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew 9, 36. In Matthew 18, 14, he says, I'm not willing that any of these little ones would perish. In uh, Mark 10, 21, uh, even, even though the, the rich young ruler went away, he, he, it, it says that Jesus loved him. And it, it's the word agape. Jesus agape loved the rich young ruler, even though he rejected him. Luke 13, 34, uh, he longs, he said of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, Jews, he said, I have longed to gather you under my wings. And in Ezekiel 33, 11, he says, I take, I take no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would all come to repentance. Second Peter 3, 9, um, I'm patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. First Timothy two three four. First Timothy chapter two verses three and four. Uh, but God our Savior wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. John three sixteen. You all know that. Lamentations three verse thirty three. He does not willingly bring affliction or grief to men. So God, his mission is total total global conquest. He's, he's trying to save. He came to seek and to save the lost. So this is not to this is this is this is not to damn you. This this is or me. This is to save us. This is this is to motivate these disciples. Think about these 12 disciples now. They're learning about the kingdom. They're learning that while wow, these seeds go out and uh, and one of them falls on good soil and produces fruit. And then and then the, the next thing Jesus says, he says, uh, look, yeah, yeah, okay, now you got this good seed over here, but then you got these weeds that are growing right next to it, right up until the end of the age. And then he says, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed. And then he says, you know, the, the kingdom of God is like yeast. And then he says, you know, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in the field. And then he says, you know, the kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price. And then he says, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. He said, I'm 
My, my mission is total global conquest. And so I'm going to go through all the earth with this huge dragnet. And uh, you might think of the dragnet as the church, the body of Christ. And this, this, this dragnet going through the whole world, trying to gather in as many as possible, as many as possible. But then one day, the net will be drawn, taut, and be brought up on the shore, and then we're going to sit down, and uh, out of that big net, there will be some who are in the right group, the good group, and there will be some who are in the bad group. And so Jesus is instructing the disciples on the kingdom of God, what it's like, its finality, the reality of the consequence of not being part of the kingdom. And he's doing this because of his love. You know, why do parents say scary things? Why do parents say scary things? My, my wife, I asked my wife if, uh, well, actually, my son came to me and asked if he could ride his bike uh, down the sidewalk on Maitland Avenue up to the ice cream store seven-tenths of a mile away. And I said, well, it's okay with me, but let me talk to your mom. He said, I, he, he didn't say it, but... I got the impression, yeah, well, that's why, yeah, that's why I came to you first. <laughs> but his mother remembered that two years earlier, she was out riding a bike with him, and he, he fell off his bike, and when, when he got up, he said, hey, Mom, I can see two of everything. <laughs> and so parents say scary things because that, that's, that, kind of thing, that kind of thing actually happens. Parents say scary things to motivate the right kind of behavior. And that's what Jesus is, is doing right here. Now, later, later, uh, these disciples don't know it yet, but later he's going to send them out on the mission of total global conquest. And what he's helping do right now by explaining this, this parable is, is he's, he's, he is explaining to them, he's bringing them up to speed. And he's giving them the information that they're going to need to be motivated when, when the opposition comes to be motivated to talk to people about the kingdom because they're going to get pushed back. But they're going to think, well, yeah, I'm getting pushed back, but you don't need you need to understand there's a finality to this. You know, there is an end of the world. There is a reality to this. There, there are two groups. And so, yeah, you're pushing back, but I'm going to push back, too. I'm motivated to do that because Jesus has given me this Parable, Jesus has brought me up to speed on how the kingdom works. And so that's what I'm doing here with you this morning. I'm bringing you up to speed on how the kingdom of heaven works. So that you will, you will, you will be scared for people. You'll be scared for yourself. A little fear is not, not always a bad thing. Because of the, that you will sense that the, the finality, the reality, that there is a motivational power to, to, to the finality, the reality of this, this kingdom, so that, 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 that we will be excited and inspired by, that we will have a sense of urgency to help people. There are just two groups. One day I was uh, with my wife and, uh, in Gestad, Switzerland. Uh, and I was skiing, Patsy was not. And so uh, we went, you know, over this giant valley and this big, um, what do they call those gondolas? It was like, you know, 500 people or something anyway, up to the top of this glacier. And then uh, everybody just took off skiing. So I just, I took off skiing too, and I just followed them down, you know. And about five minutes later, everybody stops, and they're sort of forming up. So I stopped too, and... One of the guys came over and said in some thick European accent, he said, are you with a group? I said, group? What group? He said, oh, oh okay, well, just wait there a second. And then he went and he got a, a, another guy who apparently was a, a guide. And he came over and interviewed me just to figure out who I was. And then he explained that this was a, a group that was uh, skiing all the way down the mountain, uh, down into the valley, and then the only way to get out of the valley was with a helicopter. 
and, and, and apparently it's like advanced expert skiing. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not like an advanced expert skier. I'm not even like, well, yeah, okay. So, so, I, so I said, oh, no problem. So I, I started taking off my skis and I put them over my thing and started walking back up the hill. He said, where are you going? He said, well, you know, I, I, I appreciate what's going on. I'll just, I'll just go on back up. He said, no, 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 no. I, I can't, by Swiss law, I can't leave you. You, you, you. you now have to come with us. And so I, uh, we're, going, we're going fast, and we're going just like on a 007 movie, you know. And they go off these steep mountains. I, I, I promise you, 100 feet ledges that are, that are straight down, and they're skiing down these 90-degree angles, and somehow they're getting... Traction. I mean, and then they, they end up in this forest. All this is kind of a blur in my memory, but, but I was there. And, and I was so scared that I would fall down and die that I didn't fall down. But we go through this, this forest, and they're going... And every time they do that, there's a tree that they just missed. And, and I don't know how in the world I, I survived, but I was so afraid that I, would end up, I, that I wouldn't be able to keep up with the group. I was so motivated that I was so afraid that I would die that I made sure that I stayed with the group. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across this morning. That's the big idea. The more I fear for the end, the more motivated I am for the present. The more I fear for the end, the more I fear for, for the end of me, and the more I fear for the end of other people, then the more motivated I am for the present. Make sense? So let's next talk a little bit about the mission, uh, the, uh, the method that Jesus used, rather, the method uh, of Jesus. <clears throat> the idea is everything. Uh, and, and, you know, ideas are more powerful than labor. Ideas set forces in motion that once released can no longer be contained. And Jesus' idea of total global conquest and this, this vision of the kingdom of heaven, this is his vision. And so his method is the first thing Jesus is doing with the disciples. He is casting this vision. He's casting this vision, this compelling, clear, resonant vision of the kingdom of heaven. And he wants the disciples to understand it. And, and his method is men. Jesus' method is men. Uh, Robert Coleman wrote a great book called The Master Plan for Evangelism. And that's like the number one point in the book. The first point in the book, not the only point, but the first point in the book is that men are his method. And so isn't it interesting, isn't it fascinating, of all the failures, of all the ideas of, of the Chavez revolution, of, of socialism, of all the businesses that fail, of all the product ideas that fail, that Jesus' idea, total global conquest, that he would bank his success or failure on 12 ordinary guys. 12 ordinary guys. Extraordinary. And so he's building into these men and that's, and that's what we are doing here together. Jesus is banking. Jesus is betting the advancement of his kingdom on us. He's investing in us. He's teaching us about the kingdom of God and how it works. We're part of this method of this total global conquest. So what's the result? Well, you know, 25% of the world identify themselves today as Christians. Really the most successful idea that's ever been put, put forward. The big idea again today, the more I fear for the end, the more motivated I am for the present. This is what Jesus wants. Jesus wants you to be a little scared, okay? He, he wants you to be a little scared because that will help you and me. He wants me to be a little scared too, to be a little motivated, be more motivated for not only myself, but also for, for others. Final thing to talk about this morning, you know, what, what does total global conquest look like at 9 a.m.? I want to give you four things. 
The, the first thing is that you would have an urgent perspective, an urgent perspective. C.S. Lewis tells the story. I tried to find it this week. I couldn't find it. So I, I, I think I might have the end wrong, but it, it still works. C.S. Lewis told the story uh, about uh, standing on a bluff. It was an illustration uh, that he made up. The idea, uh, uh, there's a person standing up on a bluff, and they can see a, a train rumbling down the tracks. And on the train, all the people are merry and happy and joyful and celebrating. But the person on the bluff can see a few miles forward on the track and, and can see that, that where there is a train bridge over a, a huge uh, gulf that the train track uh, has washed out and that these people and, and, uh, are traveling merrily to their own destruction. That's, that's the picture. And, and that is exactly the kind of... That's what Jesus wants us to see. He wants us to see that same picture. He wants us to have uh, an urgent perspective that, that, that the, the world is rolling merrily along the track, but the bridge is washed out and the entire train and, and not too, in the not too, distant, not too distant future is going to all tumble down into the ravine. So the first thing uh, that it means at, at nine, nine o'clock is that we should have an, a more urgent perspective about the people around us. The second thing is to have an all-inclusive approach, an all-inclusive approach. <clears throat> you see it here. Jesus is trying to get as many people in the net as he can. The, 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 in the church, the idea, we as the body of Christ, we should be trying to, to, to gather in as many people as we can. It does not matter. It does not matter. Uh, you don't need to have people pass some sort of a, a loyalty test or say a prayer in exactly the right order or something like that in order to, to, to invite them to be part of what we're doing. The idea is we invite them to be part of what we're doing and some of the people will get it right away and some of the people might not get it for 20 years. But we don't kick them out. We don't kick them out because they, they don't know the, 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 the... They don't have... They can't repeat the right... They can't pass the loyalty test or they don't remember the secret handshake or whatever it is. We don't kick anybody out. It, we take an all-inclusive approach. And so when you have somebody today at 9 o'clock and, uh, and, they're, and they're a little off in, in the way they think, that doesn't mean that you exclude them. Uh, you should have a, a, an inclusive approach. So you see uh, an urgent perspective, an inclusive approach. Third, trust no one. Trust no one. It, it, it says in this text very clearly that some people that are in the net, in the church, uh, will make it and some will not. Not everybody who is professing Christ uh, verbally actually has yielded their heart in surrender and repentance to Jesus. We have had a number of examples from this Bible study. I'm thinking of one where a, a businessman started coming to this Bible study. I learned that he was a leader in his church. He was the chairman of the pastor relations committee in his church and had all, exactly all the right words. Well, we went to lunch at his, uh, his, his uh, request. We went to lunch one day <clears throat> at his club. He bought, thanks. And, uh, <clears throat> and about halfway through the lunch, I realized this guy's not saved. <laughs> I, he, 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 for, for half the lunch, it sounded like he was, but then all of a sudden, it just, 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 it dawned on me, I don't, think that, I don't think he's saved. And so 
we, we began to talk about surrender to Jesus Christ and the idea that, that uh, how, how Christianity is, is not something you do, uh, but it's a relationship with Jesus and so forth. And, uh, and, and his face turned white. His face turned white. So uh, over the, the course of the afternoon, we exchanged several emails, and by the, by the end of the day, he had moved from one group to the other. He had moved from the, the bad group to the good group. Uh, but, but he thought, he thought he was in the good group, you see. How scary is that? Trust no one. You know, if you can't get a clear testimony from somebody about their faith in Jesus, then, then you should not, you should not presume. Uh, you should have, you should be afraid of the finality and reality of, of this, this kingdom thing and, and, be, and let yourself be motivated to, to press in because Jesus is telling this parable because what he wants you to, he wants you to press in. He wants you to press in. Trust no one. You're his ambassador, okay? Like this is like a, by and large, now there's some people here who are still investigating the Christian faith, but by and large, almost two-thirds of you are leaders. Most of you lead Bible studies, okay? Trust no one. And then the final uh, thing to, to, for, for, for 9 o'clock is... Um, <clears throat> Just to, to be an evangelist, to talk to people about the kingdom, and, uh, and just ask people, are you in the group? Are you part of the group? Group? What group? When we started, my wife and I started going to uh, Asbury United Methodist Church, some young Businessmen took an interest in me, and uh, their, they and their wives invited Patsy over for dinner. And I remember I was sitting on the couch, and one of the women was uh, sitting on the floor at the coffee table, and, and uh, she said, uh, are you a Borneo Christian? I said, what? excuse me, a what? A, a Borneo Christian? She said, no, no. I said, a, are you a born-again Christian? Uh, she had said born again the first time, but I thought she said Borneo. Well, what she was saying is, what she was really saying is she was really saying, are you with a group? And it was pretty obvious <laughs> that I wasn't with a group. And it was because of their influence and, and many other things that uh, most of my prayers of my wife, Patsy, that I came to Christ. The big idea this morning, the more I fear for the end... The more I understand the end, the more scary it seems to me. You know, I don't want to fall down and see double vision. You know, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want anybody else to be left behind. The more I fear for the end, then the more motivated I will be for the present. This means so much. This is, this is such a motivational. All of these, all of these parables are motivational. But Jesus does in this particular one, he wants to come off a little scary, and he does. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, first of all, thank you so much for um, the seven parables in Matthew 13 about the kingdom and uh, how we can kind of see uh, a, a lot of how it works. Now, there are lots of other parables that you've also given, but... These, these seven kind of give us a, a very good picture of what the kingdom is like and how it works. Lord, I, I pray that, um, Lord, I don't think we can walk out of here and talk to, to people boldly about hell. I just don't think we live in a culture that responds to that very well, at least. And yet, Lord, uh, somehow give us each the sensitivity uh, and uh, and the perspective um, to to talk to people about the finality of of this this world and the reality that there are two groups. And Lord, help us to be motivated. That Lord, this is a message about sending. This is about a message about sending us out uh, into the world. It's about 
bringing uh, us up to speed on, on, on how your kingdom works and how you want us to respond. Lord, you are all about total global conquest. And we are in on the best idea that's ever been advanced. And I pray, Father, that you would show each of us how we might respond in, in meaningful ways to help advance your idea. In Jesus' name, amen.